Okay, good morning, folks. Um, my name is Sandy. I am the social worker here at the Cardiac Rehab. Thank you so much for joining uh, me on this discussion to talk a little bit about the role of our emotions and how we can use them to do better uh, physically. So this is the last of the core talks, the first talks that you had with our dietitian Beata focused on how you can start making changes to your heart health through your food choices. But this talk will be a little bit different and it'll look at how your emotional health plays a really important role on your physical health. So as I mentioned, I'm Sandy. I'm the social worker here. Uh, I will be talking in a minute about the social work support that is available to you during your time with us at the cardiac rehab. But I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk with you about this really important connection between the mind and the body. So here is our agenda for our short discussion today. We're going to talk about that mind-body connection and discuss some common emotional responses um, that us humans all have, not only during times of stress, but definitely when we're dealing with the stress of a chronic health condition. And we'll also be review reviewing um, some common ways to cope better and to manage some of the negative thoughts and emotions that come up for us um, during the experience of dealing with a health issue. So here's my contact information. Um, part of the care that we offer here at the Cardiac Rehab is one-to-one -one counseling support, uh, which is available to you at no cost during your six month uh, participation in the cardiac rehab. Now I'm biased, but I believe that counseling can be really helpful if you're having a tough time around stress management, which is an issue for all of us at different points of, in our life. But perhaps if you're having some considerable stress around a relationship or work issues, uh, or just having a tough time adjusting to what you're dealing with health-wise, these are all good reasons to um, seek out counseling. And again, it's available to you uh, during your six month time with us. Uh, the other piece I wanted to mention is that if you're having any practical issues, so for example, if you are having financial issues or are having a difficulty managing the cost of medications, please feel free to reach out to me um, so that I can review some government programs that you might be eligible for. Um, here on your screen is also a list of group education programs uh, that really focus on emotional wellness. I run a stress mood management class and uh, I'm working on offering that online as we are still only able to offer our classes virtually. Uh, but this is a class that um, in our typical program I run in person a few times a year. Um, and so look out for some emails around the online version, which will be coming in the fall. And it's a free six week class that'll help you beef up your stress management strategies, which incidentally, the things that we use to cope with stress are the things that we use to pull up our mood. So that's why that class is called the Stress and Mood Management Workshop. We also um, run a, a great class called the Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction Workshop. Now, if you'd like some more information about what mindfulness is, I do cover that in the stress management class. But this one, this group in particular is run by uh, one of our partners, Dr. Mabel Sin. Uh, she's a family doctor who runs these free programs. Now, um, sorry, it's a, it's a $50 limited fee. This program is on hold for now uh, because Dr. Sin is not able to offer it online. Um, however, if you would like some information about mindfulness resources and groups in the community, please reach out to me. There are a good list of things happening throughout our community. And lastly, I in person have offered different wellness workshops, but again, through our virtual program, we are now offering wellness Wednesdays, a couple Wednesdays a month. Uh, you'll notice some of the emails are dedicated to different topics, um, but we offer a range of them uh, throughout the year when we are back at our regularly scheduled program and those have a bit of a fee. So if you have any questions about any of these group programs, again, feel free to give me a call. Okay, so let's start with the, the mind-body connection. So 
Research strongly supports that what we think and what we feel impacts our body, impacts how we feel physically. I'd like you to think about a bad day that you've had recently where your body just wasn't cooperating. Maybe that was due to pain. Maybe you're recovering from a surgery. Maybe you're dealing with medication side effects that are just causing you a, a huge depletion of your energy and, and insurmountable for fatigue. I just want you to think about a day where your body just stopped you dead in your tracks. And on that day, what was going on in your mind? Think about that for a minute. Usually when things are not going our way physically is when we really have this influx of negative thoughts and emotions that flood our minds. And of course, that's gonna make us feel worse physically. You know, these negative thoughts and feelings just make pain worse, they feed fatigue and so on. And so when there's changes in our health, it's really important for us to take stock of what's going on in our mind, what's happening with our emotions, and what we're saying to ourselves, because this can be the first step in making us feel a bit better, especially on days when your body isn't doing what you'd like it to do. It, those are the days that really you only have your mind to lean on to, um, to feel better, to move forward. I want to point out that this is much more than just thinking positive um, or turning that frown upside down. You know, it's true that if you are a positive optimist that, you know, it uh, certainly puts you in a better position to deal with the storms that life throws our way. Um, but sometimes that's not doable and that's OK. That's completely understandable. Life does throw us major curveballs. And of course, this impacts our life in a big way. But the mind-body connection, it's about acknowledging what's going on in, with your emotional self and acknowledging these negative emotions and thoughts, but not letting them take over. It's about us using some strategies to focus on what we can control, which is what we're telling ourselves, rather than what we can't control, which is the outside factors. And it's about trying to look at things from more of a wider lens, uh, the positive, the negative, but finding our way to balance things out so we are in a better position and feeling solid in our foundation to kind of move forward. And that's really what the mind-body connection is all about. So the truth is, though, is that when we're dealing with something like a health stress, um, it's definitely going to take a toll on our emotions. And that's quite understandable. In fact, it's quite normal. Because when these negative events happen, oh, the rest of my slide isn't coming up. There it is. Sorry. Um, so when negative events happen, it, it again is very normal for us uh, to have some negative thoughts and feelings. So the quote that you see on your screen, negative emotions are not a problem unless they're a problem. I like to start off with that because this speaks to the fact that negative emotions are part of the human experience. We're not designed to be happy all the time. In fact, it's quite normal that when negative things are happening around us or to us, we're going to react that way. We're going to react in the same way. And so this can happen even under the best circumstances. So maybe you had good medical care and, and things were caught early. Um, maybe you have a great supportive family behind you. One can still struggle with negative emotions and there's nothing wrong with that. That's quite normal, right? Um, you know, there, there's a huge host of uh, menu. There's a huge menu of options around negative emotions. So, you know, in the context of a health issue, you know, maybe you're feeling frustrated with how long it takes for things to move along, maybe how long it takes for you to see a specialist. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed with all the changes that you feel that you need to make or people have told you that you need to make. Uh, maybe you're feeling a bit down with some of the losses that come with this health issue or feeling anxious or fearful about your future because of your health issues. So these are all understandable responses uh, to dealing with a health issue. And where they become a problem is around intensity. So feeling these are not the problem. It's when they start taking over. When you're feeling these emotions every day in an intense way, it can really start to of course negatively impact your body and your health as we just talked about but it also impacts how we take care of ourselves 
Now, usually when the chips are down emotionally, we don't make the best decisions in terms of doing the things that we need to do or that are good for us and for our health. We forget to take medication. We don't have the, the, the energy or the desire to exercise. We kind of slip into some habits that make us feel a bit worse, right? So um, the other way where, you know, negative emotions can, or an intensity of negative emotions can become a problem is if it starts impacting your self-esteem, if it impacts how you, th what you think about yourself, you know, in this situation. And definitely it can impact the people around you. It impacts the quality of your relationships and certainly how we communicate. Uh, so these are all ways that an, uh, a real intense influx of emotion changes our life in a big way. So my message here, what I encourage you to do is to watch out for intensity. It's not about avoiding negative feelings. We cannot do that, right? We're human. We're responding to these things around us. But watch out for the intensity. And when you're noticing that things are, um, that these emotions are taking over, this is a great time to prioritize your emotional health and you can do this by learning some ways to regulate your emotions and you probably have a good list of things that you're doing already to help you feel better but in our short discussion today i'll also be reviewing some other tools that can help us shift gears on our emotions um, so that we are able to find ways to feel better because that's only going to impact our health in an important in a positive way as well So um, here is a range of emotions. Oop, there they are. Here are a range of emotions that we all experience uh, during times of stress, during times of change. Now, these emotions are just an important part of being human, right? And as humans, we are designed to feel a range of emotions and we like the good ones. And those, of course, are comfortable to us. But then there's these here which are not so comfortable. And again, uh, perfectly part of us just being human. And of course, when we're dealing with a major life stressor, like dealing with a health issue, it's ex it's it's normal to to feel some of these. And, and many of you may feel that you're feeling all of these on a given day, depending on what's happening. So again, this can come up. Uh, even when you know we have uh, you know good circumstances, good support from our family, um, but one can still struggle with these feelings. And again, that's part of the journey. That's part of the healing process and us adjusting and moving forward. Again, you just really want to watch out for intensity of these. But if you're feeling some of these, and it's connected with a, an event that's happening or a situation in your life, and you roll out of these feelings as quickly as you've rolled in, that's completely normal, okay? Uh, it's, it's part of that normal adjustment that we as humans get into when we're just trying to figure out what's, what we're dealing with and, and figure out ways to, uh, to, make, to move forward in a way that's meaningful for us. But again, if you're noticing that some of these feelings are um, a bit more intense or difficult to manage, this might be um, a sign for you to reach out for help in a way that is meaningful and comfortable for you. Um, it could be through using uh, people within your own support network. You know, maybe you have a, a really great friend with a really great listening ear that you can talk things out. Often that can really help us feel a lot better just by kind of airing out some of these thoughts and feelings. Um, but for some of you, it might be helpful to connect with um, more formal sources of support, and that could be through a counselor, that could be through your doctor, that could be through someone in your faith group if you're connected to one. Certainly, I would encourage you to reach out to your exercise therapist in your phone calls or your video chats, or definitely reach out to myself if you are worried about um, these emotions happening in an intense way for you. Okay, we're now gonna get into some of the more common emotions that come up when dealing with a health issue. And I'm just going to also review some coping strategies uh, that might be helpful. So we'll start off with um, shock and denial. Uh, and these are, you know, um, these are two emotions that are pretty common after a significant event, something that we're not expecting. You know, I wonder if any of you recall, you know, your, you know, any experience or feeling a bit of denial during or after a medical event or illness. 
you know, what did you tell yourself was going on? Did you just say, oh, I pulled a muscle or I have a flu or I'm feeling a little bit out of shape, right? Um, so that's quite normal. We're just trying to kind of figure things out, you know. Um, the point uh, that we like to make around shock and denial is that these are actually understandable, protective responses. So they actually play an important role uh, in our emotional health. What it does, what they do rather, is they shield us away from information that we're not ready to deal with immediately. So a little bit of shock and a little bit of denial kind of go a long way. They're not necessarily bad, you know. Um, and so when we start worrying about denial, because usually shock dissipates after a period of time, usually doesn't hang out too long. Um, but where we start worrying about denial is if you deny the re the um, the reality of your situation and you need to make some some health changes then of course you know that could be a, a health obstacle that could be an obstacle for your recovery for sure uh, and can in the end you know cause us some bigger problems but truth uh, the truth is is that most of us work through denial in our own time and um, some people might notice that they actually start feeling a bit sad or anxious, which can actually be a sign that you're moving through denial and starting to look at the reality of your situation. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? So ways to wind down um, denial is to kind of work through things at a pace that is comfortable for you. Some people are high information seekers. They need to get on Dr. Google right away to figure things out. And others were kind of slow to go I just need to kind of deal with one thing at a time. Figure out kind of what is the best pace for you. Don't put that other that added pressure of having having to get through something in a certain amount of time. We tend to work through this in our own time and so we have to allow ourselves and give us that time and that space and let people around us know what we need to kind of you know help us process information in a way that works for us. Oop. All right, that moved quickly. This is anger. Now there's a lovely little image of a little uh, toddler having a tantrum. There's a bit of a toddler in all of us. And in the health experience, there could be a lot of different sources of anger. Certainly when we feel that our body has let us down, when something happens to our body that we can't control, that can definitely cause some anger or some frustration. Um, maybe people around us telling us what to do or not to do, that can be a, a, a source of anger or frustration. Um, people experience anger towards the medical system, maybe a misdiagnosis, how long it took to get the correct diagnosis. So there could be sort of healthcare system issues that trigger some anger for us. Um, so there are lots of good sources of anger when we're dealing with a health diagnosis for sure. And again, while that's perfectly normal, uh, perfect, no, perfectly normal response for us humans, the, why we really want to highlight anger and watch out for the intensity of anger is that it's probably one of the most physical emotions. Now, all emotions have a physical component, uh, but anger in particular is one that for sure takes over our mind, but it really wreaks havoc on our body. Think about that, you know, physically, what happens to you when you are really flip your top off upset? You know, our heart rate increases, our blood pressure spikes, we become short of breath, we feel tense, maybe we have sort of, you know, muscle tensions or even chest pain, right? So this is when we really are concerned, you know, if anger is something that you feel here and there, that's perfectly normal, but if you're feeling it, a lot of the time it could really um, put a lot of pressure on your cardiovascular system for sure. The other thing is from a, a thinking point of view is that anger really impairs our ability to think clearly, to think rationally, and it um, it does this by diminishing our cognitive processes, which is our, our thinking processes, um, and that includes um, you know, shifting our 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 our, um, our our skills around memory, creativity, and concentration. So when we're angry, our thinking shifts into a mode that heightens our perceptions of bad things, and we start treating these assumptions as if they were facts. So it really takes over our mindset as well. Um, so when we think a little bit about how to um, 
to wind down anger, um, the first thing is that, you know, it's, it's important that we um, consider taking a bit of a timeout. Perhaps you use that strategy with your, your children when they were small um, to give them a bit of time out when uh, they were having a bit of a tantrum. Well, we as adults can, can really use a time out as well. It's probably one of the best things that you can do in the throes of anger is to remove yourself temporarily from the situ situation to really um, get centered and burn off some of that emotion and bring the, that cognitive rational thinking ability back. Research actually has looked at the issue of the cognitive changes during uh, a, um, a fleet of anger and shows that it takes the average average individual 22 minutes to resume rational thinking when they're angry. And certainly that could be a lot longer for you if there's something that's really tremendously bothering you. So having a quick timeout, taking a quick timeout really gives us the opportunity to regroup, resume some of that rational thinking. Another strategy is to participate in a distraction technique. Now, as smart as you all are, the brain cannot focus fully well on doing two things at once. Now, you may be a wonderful multitasker in your life, but when it comes to emotions, if you are feeling really angry and you decide, hey, I'm gonna do something else to get my mind off this, the anger winds down. And this is not avoiding the anger, but it's finding ways to feel better in a purposeful way. So I'd encourage you to think about things or engage in distraction techniques that, that make you feel good quickly. Um, you know, it could be, you know, going for a quick walk. It could be engaging in a hobby or something that makes you feel good. It could be exercise, nothing like sweating things out to really wind down stress and anger for sure. Um, another way to cope with anger is to talk things out and, you know, maybe having a bit of a, a venting session with someone that you trust. You want to warn them, though, that you um, uh, that's a venting session so that they know just to li listen. But again, um, it's about talking things out and getting that support and, and validation from someone can often be helpful. The one thing I want to highlight, though, is that if anger comes up a lot for you, um, sometimes anger is what we call a secondary emotion in that there's something else feeding it and it's just covered up by anger. So if you notice that um, there are certain triggers that keep coming up for you, have a step back and, and ask yourself, what's fueling this for me? Because usually it's that issue or that feeling that you, ha you have to problem solve. And for some of us, it's easier to get all hot and bothered and upset rather than to admit more um, vulnerable feelings like sadness and fear, you know, uh, or feeling a, a sense of, of guilt in some way. Uh, so really maybe, you know, um, you know, pick it apart a little bit and analyze a little bit if you're noticing that something's coming up for you. And often you can find the, um, your, you can put the spotlight in a different problem that needs to be worked through. So um, again, um, if anger is a real problem for you and certainly it's affecting your health and affecting your relationships, feel free to reach out to me and we can talk more individually about strategies that might be more workable for you. Okay, now we're gonna get to the um, big emotions that are quite common in any stress and that's anxiety and depression. I first want to highlight the fact that anxiety, although we typically don't like the negative side of anxiety, uh, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but anxiety is normal. We all need it. We, it's part of our survival mechanism, not only for us, us humans, but all the animals. It's around the fight or flight that you might be aware of. That's anxiety. It's our body's way of alerting us to changes and challenges. Now, of course, we are a bit more aware of the negative side of anxiety, which includes excessive worrying, nervousness, and panicky feelings. And for some people, though, that can be really intense and result in panic attacks, which are really, really scary. And there really is a vicious cycle, as you see on the screen there. 
it's this kind of circular process of how it's usually a negative thought which triggers some fear our body um, you know responds to that in a really important way it just wreaks havoc on our bodies and we'll talk about that in the next slide when we look at some of the closer symptoms but all that does is generate more anxiety so it's a it's a really tough it's an easy cycle to get into but it's a really tough cycle to get out of Here are a lot of the signs of anxiety. There's a lot of physical symptoms, which include a racing heart, upset stomach, rapid shallow breathing, shoulder, chest pain. Now, these are a little bit worrisome, especially with uh, our people in the cardiovascular uh, rehab program, because sometimes people don't know if they're if it's just anxiety or if they're dealing with a cardiac issue. And, and some people find that some of the symptoms feel similar or sound similar. So um, what I would encourage you to do is if you don't know if you're having a panic attack or a heart attack, I would always strongly encourage you to err on the side of caution and seek medical attention. This is why we are lucky enough in you know, Canada to have a pretty good medical system and have emergency departments uh, with experts who, who figure out if this is, uh, you know, what type of medical issue this is, right? And so err on the side of caution and go seek medical attention. And so I, these are some of the common signs uh, of anxiety, anxiety, and some of them may be common to you. Um, and I guess the point here is that, you know, although most people worry about one thing or another at different points of their life, and again, that's pretty normal. It's, it's a pretty normal Canadian thing to be a worry ward. What, these worries usually don't tend to interfere with day-to-day -day activities. So that's where anxiety is a perfectly normal response to what's happening around us. However, if things don't get better, if the anxiety worsens, if some of these symptoms really start to, 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 to snowball for you, it isn't really important for you to get medical attention because as you know, anxiety itself can be intense anxiety is a medical diagnosis and there are different forms of anxiety disorders and you can get some really good medical treatment for that. But there are also some things that we can do on our own to wind down anxiety and worry. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. But for now, I just wanna also talk about depression. So, you know, every um, human life has its share of sorrows and there's no getting, uh, getting around it. Um, sadness, you know, rolls in like a fog, you know, we mourn, we cry, and again, that's a perfectly normal response to, you know, to terrible, uh, heartbreaking things happening to us and around us. But eventually, you know, this fog lifts and we're able to move forward, we're able to get on with things, right? And this is when things like grief and sadness come up and these are appropriate and normal reactions to significant life events, to things happening around us, you know, um, and we can experience this by crying, feeling a bit down, withdrawing, but usually, you know, when the situation irons itself out, we are feeling a bit better, right? Things starting to subside and we're able to kind of, we feel more like ourselves. But for some, sadness just gets a grip and just won't let go. And that's when a normal human emotion can in fact become a major medical illness. So depression, um, you know, is very different than just having a bad day or a bad couple of days, right? You know, um, it's, it's, it's different, you know, sorry, oops, let me get back here. So major depression is 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 different than what i just described before when i was talking about sadness and grief and loss in that it, it's different in three main ways number one depression lasts a lot longer the feelings are much much more intense and it significantly interferes with day-to-day -day function and it's incredibly common for us to experience depression in fact in canada one in four Canadian adults will experience some form of depression. There are different forms in terms of mild, moderate, and severe. Um, one in four of us will experience depression during some time in our adult lives. So 
here are the common signs of depression. Sorry for the busy slide, but there are a lot of things that fall under uh, the spectrum of some of the symptoms of, of clinical depression. And so it's really characterized by profound, severe sadness, feeling hopeless a lot of the time, inability to feel pleasure, uh, your get up and go, got up and went and just won't let loose. Um, there's a loss of interest in activities that you used to do that you used to really enjoy. We just, you just can't be bothered. Changes in your sleep, changes in your fatigue, your energy level, feeling nervous, jumpy, you know, inadequate, feeling inadequate, you know, um, really overwhelming feelings of guilt, trouble thinking clearly, trouble making a decision, trouble with your memory or concentration. And, and the big alarm bell around depression is thoughts that you would be better off dead. So, you know, thoughts of dying or thoughts of suicide. So this is how, these are some of the common symptoms that have depression. And so if you, again, are feeling these in a very intense way, I'm going to really encourage you to reach out to your doctor. Now, part of a medical assessment, um, part of the job of a doctor that, that many of them do quite well is, is really speaking to the psychological side of things. However, they often don't ask, especially when there's so many other things to talk about in, in a medical appointment. But please, if you notice that you are feeling super worried all of the time and it's impacting your life in a big way, or if you're feeling any of these symptoms on your screen in a very intense way, this is a major medical issue that warrants attention. You know, and so put up that on the agenda, reach out to your doctor. You know, many people do not want to reach out to, to their physicians about feeling sad or down because they don't want to be put on another medication, quite frankly. So what I want to point out is that there really is good treatment out there for depression. And if your symptoms are mild to moderate, most doctors would be quite comfortable with having a watchful, conservative approach, encouraging you to get some counseling to help you uh, develop some coping strategies to feel better. Um, and so they can put medication um, on the shelf. For many people, medication isn't indicated. Um, but that, you know, it's important to bring this up with your doctor to not hold this back because you don't want to be placed on an antidepressant, but rather have a discussion. And often those, meeting with, those meetings with our doctors can be really, really helpful, but certainly count, there's an important role for counseling as well. So, but the, while there's an important role for counseling, there's also an important role for things that we can do for ourselves to feel better, especially uh, with coping better with anxiety and depression. And that's what we'll talk about now. So um, my first suggestion is to pick up on your signs of low mood or anxiety, anxiety sooner. You know, uh, if we start paying attention to some of the subtle signs uh, that our mind and our bodies give us, or even our, re our, our responses, our behaviors, many people start noticing that they become much more short tempered or they start dabbling on comfort snacky foods or they start having difficulty sleeping. Pick up on what your signs are of anxiety and depression sooner because often there are quick things that we can do uh, that will work in the moment and help us feel better. It really will stop that snowball from growing. Again, watch out for intensity, speak with your doctor if you're concerned or reach out to anyone here uh, to be able to kind of talk things out. My next suggestion is using a distraction technique. And as I mentioned before, when we talked about strategies to manage anger, you know, distraction techniques are really, help, really, really helpful. Again, these are things that we do to help us feel better in the moment. These are purposeful activities that we decide to do to kind of regulate our emotions. And that could be um, anything for any one of us. I know that on your, maybe, you know, on, you have on your uh, on your screen there, a the question and a, uh, answer pane. Feel free to, to, to type out what works for you. What are things, what are activities that you can get into that take your mind away on how you're feeling for a little bit to help burn off some of that emotion. And then you're able to go back to your, back to the problem and try to look for some solutions. So these can be things like exercise, again, getting into a hobby, be just anything to start interrupting that negative thinking, that kind of cyclical, you know, kind of hamster 
the wheel thought process that we all get into. I also call it the monkey mind. If we get away from the monkey mind for a little bit, what we're able to do is to go back to it and look at real strategies to feel better or to try to start looking at some solutions to some of our difficulties. But there's also an important role in paying attention to what we tell ourselves. So that's your self-talk. And these play a critical role in help regulating our emotions. So, you know, we can change the way we're feeling by changing the thoughts that come that produce some of these negative feelings. So again, I'm not suggesting avoiding bad thoughts, but rather take stock, ask yourself, what am I saying to myself right now? And starting to put some of these thoughts in perspective. Often, if we're able to neutralize our thoughts, if we're, we often see alternatives and we don't feel so badly, right? We don't feel so rotten about ourselves. And so this only comes when we almost imagine a stop sign to stop the thinking and take a step back and ask yourself, what am I saying to myself about this situation? Is this the only way of looking at the situation? Are there any other explanations besides what I'm telling myself? What in the situation? What in the situation is in my control? That's another good question to neutralize things. But one of the most helpful questions that I would encourage you to ask yourself when you find yourself kind of in your head a bit too much is, what would I tell a friend with the same situation rather than what I tell myself? Often, we are just those good, helpful people to those around us, but just terrible to that person in the mirror. So if you're able to take a step back, neutralize some of these thoughts, really look at challenging some of these negative, intense thoughts and looking at the middle ground, we often feel better. But this is hard, hard work. If it was easy to change the way we think, we'd all be doing it by now. But it's hard work that requires practice, kind of like playing an instrument. You know, we don't get good at it right away. And, and so we need to keep practicing it. And it's helpful to start using, dabbling some of these thinking strategies when we're feeling, when things are not working out for us. So I want to point out that uh, healthy self-talk or healthy thinking doesn't necessarily mean positive thinking. No one can look at things positively all the time. Bad things happen. Uh, it's normal for us to be upset and have, have negative thoughts when these things happen in our lives. But healthy thinking means looking at the entire situation, the positive, the negative, and the neutral parts, and then coming to a conclusion. It's about looking thing, at things in a balanced way, and that often makes us feel a lot better. Lastly, I want to point out the important role of self-care and relaxation. Uh, these are, you know, I'm encouraging you to look at activities that, you know, really fuel your mood in a positive way. And again, um, self-care can include some of those hobbies, those, those activities that we enjoy that bring us pleasure and joy. That's a really important part of our emotional well-being is prioritizing those activities. But it's also taking care of your body, you know, eating well, physical activity, prioritizing sleep. These are all the basics in helping to regulate our mood. Um, relaxation techniques also play a really important role in stabilizing our mood, burning off stress that we're all experiencing, um, helping with sleep and definitely helping with anxiety and worry because they turn off the stress response. Now, I, I really don't, I'm not able to get into um, detail around this. Um, certainly a future Wellness Wednesday, we'll talk about some stress management 101. Uh, if you'd like some more information around uh, relaxation techniques, which can include things like deep breathing, uh, meditation, um, maybe uh, yoga or Tai Chi. There's so many options and there's no one size fits all. And in fact, if you've got a smartphone, which most people do, there are some great apps that you can download for free that can guide you through some meditations and relaxation techniques. But if you'd like to kind of piece this out, uh, feel free to join the uh, Wellness Wednesday sessions or the stress management group that's coming up or reach out to me one on one. Um, but it's really important to prioritize the self-care and relaxation because what it does is it fuels our emotional tank, our emotional gas tank in an important way. And again, if we're feeling good emotionally, that's going to translate to us doing better physically. All right. So um, 
Oh, one last thing before I get to my conclusion. Um, I want to really briefly mention the role of intimacy. I will have a, a Wellness Wednesday topic on this, I think near the end of September. So watch out for the dates and times for that. But, you know, I really want to highlight the fact that certainly a cardiovascular or any illness can really pose a challenge to a couple's intimate relationship. And sexuality is an important part of intimacy for, for many couples, but things like fear and anxiety, changes in our sex drive, or even medication side effects can make um, sex more complex than it was before. So, of course, as we've talked about, a chronic illness can definitely affect our feelings and, and our responses in indirect and indir uh, indirect in, or in indirect ways. It also I really want to point out that intimacy or sexual intimacy does not have to disappear from a couple's life when one partner is unwell physically. And this can be a really important um, or difficult, but of course important subject to address. So I'd really encourage you to just start talking things out with your partner. You or your partner may have some concerns um, that you are hesitant to talk about. However, um, it's likely that they have them too. So just opening up the dialogue, it really uh, does an important job of us, you know, coming down to the same ground and feeling better. The other piece is, is that, you know, you may have bona fide reservations around your safety and, you know, around um, whether or not if it's safe, you know, you know, how it's going to impact your your health, um, you know, if there's changes around your desire, your sexual ability, is this normal? So that's a medical component as well. So again, I would encourage you to talk to your doctor for specific information and for specific advice. Doctors often won't ask you about this question. However, most of them are perfectly happy to answer the question. So I would really encourage you to um, to open up the topic with your doctor. It can be something simple like, hey, Dr. Smith, I'm really noticing some changes in my sex drive. Can, can we talk about this? And there are, you know, again, this is actually part of a medical assessment as well, right? Lastly, it's important to listen to your body. You know, again, you know, you and your partner, it's about communicating and, and, and really letting your partner know what you're comfortable with, what you're not comfortable with, um, and, and working, um, working through things in your own way. There's no right or wrong answer. All right. So um, again, if you have more specific questions around how the intimacy has changed, how your sexual relation or sexual relationship desire or function has changed, definitely bring that up with your doctor for specific information um, and, and advice, or certainly reach out to your exercise therapist or myself and we can speak to you one-on-one -on -one and give you the information that will benefit you. All right, I think that's it for me. I just want to give you some, some key messages. Watch out for that intensity of negative emotions. Connect with your doctor if you're concerned about your mood. This is a really important part of your health that warrants attention if you're noticing that it's just, you know, um, you know, gain, getting to be too much for you. Consider which strategies work for you. You know, which are the activities, which, what are the things that, that feel the best for you that boost your mood? And often this can change. Certainly if um, the activities that you used to really enjoy that made you feel good were physical ones, and perhaps these are on the shelf right now, don't wait. You have to find things that make you feel good physically because they will impact your body. So it's about maybe being a bit creative and looking for other things that can help you feel better or trying out new things like a relaxation technique. Often relaxation techniques work better than medication when it comes to regulating our mood and helping us with stress. Um, again, prioritize activities that fuel your emotional gas tank. And, and, and use your people. You've got wonderful people in your life. You are a wonderful person in someone, someone's life. So reach out to people who, uh, who are there for you um, and, and let them be there for you uh, in a way that, uh, that you need. So open up, that really does help and goes a long way. I hope some of these things were helpful to you. I'm just gonna switch over here to see if there are any questions. Okay, there's one question here, which is my family is pushing me to make lots of big changes and this is causing me a lot of stress. What should I do? Well, what I'd first like to say is, you know, 
God love the people around us. You know, they really, really want to help us and be there for us. And sometimes they just don't know how. And so it sounds with like with this question that perhaps there's a lot of love and good intention, but it's not landing in the right way. And so my suggestion would be to communicate, to really tell your people what's helpful and what's not helpful. And of course you can use the words that, you know, work better for you, but this could be something like, hey, thank you for giving me this meal plan, but I really want to work on this instead. Or just be direct in terms of, direct and kind in terms of, you know, what they can say or do that can be helpful to you, right? Often this comes from, from a place of worry and love, and they don't know what's working and what's not working unless you let them know. So all we can do is try to communicate better our point of view rather than lash out or shut down because either way they're not going to get uh, the real message about what you would find helpful. So I hope that helps. I want to thank you again so much for uh, joining me today. If there's anything I can do to be helpful, please feel free to reach out. Uh, you can also reach out to your exercise therapist during your phone calls or your virtual visits and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Thanks, folks.